Well, good day, everybody, and uh, thank you for being here. I'm John Dernbach, and I direct the Environmental Law and Sustainability Center here at Wider Commonwealth Law School. A key part of our uh, work at the center was hosting knowledgeable speakers on a variety of topics. We made a point of giving our speakers the opportunity to reach beyond the academy and into the broader community, which is why we're doing today's program on Zoom. Today's speaker is Robert Altenberg. He's director of the Energy Center at Citizens for Pennsylvania's Future, also known as Penn Future. Uh, he'll be speaking today on Bitcoin, energy, and climate in Pennsylvania. Uh, as you may have seen in a recent lengthy article in the New York Times, energy-hungry Bitcoin mining operations have been located in Pennsylvania and other states, powered largely by fossil fuels. This presentation will introduce basic concepts of cryptocurrency and blockchains, explain why wasting energy is part of Bitcoin's design, and outline what that means for public health and the environment. Now, that, in my view, is a really big job um, because many of us, including me, remain mystified by Bitcoin in spite of numerous efforts by others to explain it. So I'm looking forward to being enlightened by this. Um, Rob will also discuss what legal and policy tools might be available to address uh, concerns that, uh, uh, for this industry. Um, Rob has testified on this topic before the U.S. Senate Subcommittee on Clean Air, Climate, and Nuclear Safety. He's been interviewed by ABC, NBC, Atlantic, Fortune, Capital and Maine, and other media. Uh, we're proud to say uh, that Rob is also a 2008 graduate of our law school. Almost two, 20 years ago, it's hard to talk in those terms without thinking I'm older than I want to be. Um, but almost 20 years ago, I took leave from my teaching job here to direct the policy office at the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. Um, I taught a class at night while I was doing that. And during much of that time, Rob played a dual role. He worked for me in the policy office, and then he was a student in my property class. So Rob and I uh, got to know each other pretty well. Um, he is a polymath, uh, a, a pilot, a scuba diver, uh, a licensed amateur radio operator, and an expert in energy law, especially Bitcoin. I remain amazed at how many different things uh, Rob can do well. Two housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, first, if you want CLE credit for this program, please see the link in the evaluation form that will be put in the chat feature. You have to fill out the evaluation in order to get credit. Second, there will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat, or if you prefer, uh, you can ask him directly when the presentation is over. So with that, please welcome Rob Altenberg. Hey, thank you, John. Thank, thank you for, uh, for that introduction. So crypto energy and climate in Pennsylvania. So. So, as John said, we're going to talk about a couple of different things here. We're going to talk briefly about what is what is Bitcoin and why we have it, why it uses so much energy. Where this energy comes from, and we're going to break down some of the talking points we see from the crypto community as well as some of the policy solutions. That's pretty aggressive to cover in an hour, but I'll try to keep the talk to about 40 minutes and then we'll leave time for questions after that. So, starting off the whole concept of cryptocurrency, we won't delve too deeply into what money is. The economists give us this definition of medium exchange, unit of account, store of value, but money can take a lot of different forms. Certainly dollars, euros, and cash that we're used to seeing, but it can also be things like wampum beads, the ray stones of Palau, and other things have been you know, over history used for, used for money. Now there's nothing saying that we can't necessarily do something digital with value, and use that in a similar way to money. If we think of something like digital copies of Taylor Swift songs, they clearly have value. Taylor makes money off of that. Amazon Music and Spotify and others probably do as well. There's a value there, but whether or not that, operate, that can operate as a digital currency, trading those becomes a, becomes a problem. 
And one of these things that has to be solved is the double spend pro problem. Since any digital item, we can easily make an exact copy of it. If I would go to the coffee shop and try to buy coffee with a Swift buck, I could just make a copy. There would be no way to tell whether that was, you know, I'm just essentially minting my own money at that point. Obviously, that sort of thing wouldn't be sustainable. So we need some approach to solve this problem. And we actually do this in practice. We keep ledgers of who has money and who doesn't. And we pay companies, these are typically credit card companies, Visa, MasterCard, and others. We pay companies to manage this information for us. And that can make these digital transactions work. But ma managing these digital transactions online, paying companies for, for, to do this for us creates some friction. And the inventors of Bitcoin, that friction was one of the things that they were trying to eliminate. Now, Bitcoin was founded back in 2008 by a paper written by somebody using the pen name of Satoshi Nakamoto. We don't know who Satoshi was. Uh, we still don't. But the problems identified in that paper was that the internet commerce relies on trust. This trust, this friction increases costs, whether it's the transaction fees we pay to Visa uh, or uh, other fees we pay. And it's also incompatible with anonymity. So in cash, if we pay cash for a you know, good or service, there's no ledger tracing that. And we don't really have that with um, these online communications. So Nakamoto's idea was to replace this trust with essentially math using a, um, a cryptography. But it's really a lot simpler than that. It really boils down to a ledger. So you can take a ledger and simply record all of the transactions uh, when money comes into somebody's wallet and when somebody goes out of it, somebody's wallet. And every, if everybody can see the ledger, then you can, under, then you can have trust of you know, who has money and where the money moves. Now, to secure this, we have to introduce a concept called a hash. And this is a very short computer program. And what it does is really simple. It takes any block of data you give it and it makes a digital fingerprint. So in this case, the number that you see on the screen, I took a digital copy of War and Peace, ran it through this algorithm, and I get this number. It's a very, very large number. But if I run that copy through it again, I'm going to get exactly the same number. It's a unique fingerprint. And if I change anything, I change a period to a comma, if I add a space, if I change it in any way whatsoever, this number is going to be completely different. So by taking the fingerprint of this ledger, we've got a little bit way to securing it. So now if somebody wants to change this ledger of digital transactions of where money has gone, um, they would have to change the ledger and change the fingerprints as well. So that's good. It doesn't quite go far enough because we just moved the problem. Originally, the problem was we couldn't keep the ledger secure. And now the problem is we've got to keep the fingerprints secure. So Bitcoin takes it one other step using what's known as distributed ledger technology or blockchains. And this actually predates uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, but the idea is we keep these same transactions, in this case, these Bitcoin transactions, we keep them on pages of a ledger, which we call blocks. And we take that same digital fingerprint of each of these blocks, and that digital fingerprint is stored in the next block. That's the glue that holds this entire chain together. So now what happens if somebody wants to go back and change something in some of the old data, they don't just have to change one block and one fingerprint, they have to change everything in the blockchain after that. And if this is the system is designed so that this is difficult to do, well, the more difficult this is to do, the more secure this ledger is, the harder it is to change. And this is fundamentally the glue that keeps Bitcoin going. So the key then becomes how do we create a new block? So when we create a new block, it does two main things. It records transactions and it creates new Bitcoin. Every time a block is created, the first transaction is known as a Coinbase. It creates at this point 6.25 Bitcoin 
and puts it in the wallet of whoever the creator is. So it records transactions and it creates Bitcoin. Now we need a system to do this that's easy to verify so that everybody can rapidly gain consensus that, that a new block has been created. And it also has to be rate limited in some way. There has to be some mechanism. Otherwise, every possible block would be created instantly, you know, practically instantly. Uh, the, the instant hyperinflation in Bitcoin, it would have, and it would have no value. Um, so there has to be a way to rate limit it. In Bitcoin, the system is set up to rate limit it. So one block is created about every 10 minutes. So looking at a little bit more detail in what a, inside of a block, if I'm a miner and I want to create a new block, I have to gather some information. I have to take that fingerprint from the previous block and I can look that up online. I have some miscellaneous information, version numbers and times and date stamps and things like that. And then I go out and I collect all this transaction data. I have that one important transaction that gives me 6.25 Bitcoin. And then I collect online proposed transactions that other people have made uh, or want to make. Those proposed transactions, I validate them. So I go and look and say, yep, they actually have the money in their account that they, in their wallet that they are spending. And if they're good, I pack them all into this block. So now I have a candidate block that might be the next block in the chain. So how do I know if it is? And this is uh, what Bitcoin uses. It's a method called proof of work. So I take that candidate block and I run it through that same hash algorithm to get that fingerprint, but not just any fingerprint counts. For it to be the next valid block, it has to be a low number. And how low depends on how many other people are trying to do this roughly at the same time. Uh, this, is, this system is designed so the odds are that about once every 10 minutes, a new block will, create it, will be created. It's a very unlikely prospect. Right now, the odds of winning the, the Powerball lottery, about one in almost 300 million. The odds of guessing a Bitcoin block correctly the first try is worse odds than winning the Powerball in two consecutive lotteries, uh, far worse odds. It's about one in 200 billion trillion. So incredibly unlikely that somebody will just put a block together. So what miners do is they resort to technology. They use special purpose computers, supercomputers really, called application specific integrated circuits. They're boxes that all they do is calculate these hashes and they calculate them very, very fast. Um, uh, most of the modern ones, we're talking about 100 trillion of these calculations every second, and, and there's a lot of them can do more than that. Each one of these boxes, it's about the size of a large toaster. It weighs about 20 pounds, and it uses three times the energy that the average household uses. So they're amazing like, uh, energy consumption in, these, in this small package. Of course, generates a lot of heat in, in the process. Um, and miners use thousands, tens of thousands of these. We have one miner in Pennsylvania, their initial plan was to put 56,000 of these in a site. We've heard another that's, um, that plan is to put 80,000 of these mining boxes in a single site. Altogether, the Bitcoin network uses over 11 gigawatts of power. It consumes more energy than the state of New York, more than many entire countries. We've heard it described as more than all the energy required to light all the light bulbs in the United States. So an enormous amount of energy taken to do this. And so why do people spend this much? <laughs> you know, why do people go through this much trouble? And this is the profit calculation for Bitcoin. Certainly there's that cost of electricity, which is pretty steep. There's the cost of the hardware. Again, $4,000 a box isn't unusual for, for some of these ASICs, and it can get higher than that. But it's balanced against how much these miners can expect to get as a reward. Back in November of 2021, when Bitcoin was about $60,000, one of the actual blocks that was mined, the, block, the miner earned about uh, four, uh, over $400,000 in Bitcoin. 
just for mining that block, and then it, and then had transaction fees on top of that. Uh, yesterday, when I looked, one of the miners got yeah, closer to two hundred thousand. Bitcoin is down closer to is about half the half of its peak value right now, hovering around thirty thousand dollars. Fewer in fewer amount, lower amounts in fees, lower number of transactions, but they still generated quite a lot of money. I said Bitcoin was at one point sixty thousand uh, dollars. Now it's closer to thirty thousand uh, dollars. A question I often get is, why does somebody pay thirty thousand or sixty thousand or some other amount of money for Bitcoin? There's no real good answer for that. Uh, Warren Buffett just had an interview on CNBC uh, earlier in the week, and he said, you know, in his view, he said it's basically gambling. So people are buying this buying this Bitcoin hoping that it, the price is going to skyrocket, it will shoot up, uh, and they'll be able to cash out later. Uh, and there's a, some sense of a fear of missing out. People see their friends possibly making money on this, and it looks like easy money, so that attracts more buyers. It's been compared to Dutch tulip mania and other speculative bubbles we've seen. Uh, but one of the keys here is if you're trying to compare actual utility to the price of Bitcoin, it's very difficult to make that comparison. It's very difficult to say it provides any utility that justifies that price. And one of the reasons is if you want cryptocurrency and if you want blockchain technology, Bitcoin is far from the only game in town. There's literally hundreds of these altcoins, non-Bitcoin cryptocurrencies out there. And many of them, don't use the wasteful proof of work technology at all. Um, the second biggest currency out there, Ethereum, recently changed from proof of work to using a technology called proof of stake that doesn't require this sort of energy demand. And there's others, Solana, uh, Algorand, Cardano, there's dozens and dozens potentially of these things that are out there. It's, there are differences between them and Bitcoin. There are some purists that say, well, Bitcoin does certain things that only Bitcoin does or only proof of work currency does. And there are, to be sure, technical differences. But when it comes to essentially solving the problem of making digital transactions happen online, uh, when it comes to using blockchain technology for things like smart contracts and other things, uh, we have alternatives to Bitcoin. So it's very hard to justify the price. We'll take a little bit of break there between what is Bitcoin and transition into now, okay, Bitcoin uses a lot of energy, that's undisputed. Where does that energy come from? The, one of the aspects of proof of work is it is a race. So if a Bitcoin miner is the one that finds that block, if that, if that Bitcoin miner guesses correctly, they get now that two to $300,000 in a reward for doing so, but there is no prize for second place. What it comes down to is hashes equal revenue. There's no other way for Bitcoin miners to optimize it. If they want to make money, they have to try and do as many of these hashes as possible, as fast as possible. Um, Aside from that motivation, the, the hardware they buy is expensive. It doesn't last long. Uh, they want to maximize that investment. And the market is volatile. volatile. If Bitcoin's $60,000, you want to make your Bitcoin win at $60,000. You don't want to take indefinitely and see what happens to the market. You know, if you spent this money, you want to make the money now. So all of these factors together drive people to the sorts of energy that we used to call baseload power, a power that can run 24 seven, all out as much as possible. Uh, variable sources like wind and solar, well, they have advantages in that they're cheap, but they're variable and Bitcoin miners don't want variable power. They wanna run as much as they can because they're trying to maximize this hash rate. So by and large, we're seeing it coming from these traditional sources. And in Pennsylvania, there's a couple key areas. Waste coal is a big one. Now, I know for the people that are outside of Pennsylvania, they might not be as familiar uh, with waste coal, but in, and depending on where you are in, in the state, they may call it gob or bony or 
any number of other names, but we have literally billions of tons of coal waste that has been discarded sometimes over a hundred years ago, uh, littering the landscape. And our solution for decades has been to burn it. Uh, we actually subsidize, and this dates back to PURPA, the Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act. Uh, this may, dates back to that era where we were subsidizing generators to essentially remine this waste coal, put it in their uh, power plants and burn it. Now, the claim is that it reduces pollution. Um, be fair, it moves pollution. So you're taking pollution that was on the land and you're putting it in the air. And back when this was started, and really to this day, it's been politically popular because people see coal piles on the land getting smaller and they don't see pollution in the air. When, you see, when the health effects happen, they happen to somebody else, they happen downwind, but people don't tend to see it. So it's very easy to say, yes, burning it, 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 burning it is you know, the acceptable solution. Now, this decision was made in an era where we didn't have the concern for climate change that we have today. And now it gets much, much harder to say that when we're just putting this pollution in the air, and a lot of it is carbon pollution, when we're putting this pollution in the air, that that's just going away or that's becoming somebody else's problem. It's becoming everybody's problem. And we're not really accounting for the costs associated with this. We subsidize, as I said, we subsidize people to burn waste coal. We've been doing that for a while, and we're actually doing that more than ever. So one of the big areas in Pennsylvania is the Alternative Energy Portfolio Standards Act, AEPS, which has a tier two, which requires uh, electric generation service providers and uh, electric distribution companies to buy a certain amount of essentially credits for different kinds of energy sources. In tier one, there's things like wind credits with a photovoltaic, solar photovoltaic carve out, but in tier two, you have waste coal. Now, tier two credits for a long time ran around a quarter, 30 cents, maybe a megawatt hour uh, for one of these credits. Uh, at the end of 2019, our legislature, really at the behest of the waste coal industry, closed the borders for this program. So credits can no longer come from anywhere. They have to come from inside of Pennsylvania, except for some grandfathered contracts. Uh, but that's had an effect on the price. The price has spiked. So where we were spending 20 cents, 30 cents, maybe a tier two credit, now they're over $10 and in some cases spike much higher than that. In addition to this, uh, in, for waste coal in uh, last year, 2022, this was I meaning about $55 million went to just the waste coal segment alone from this program. In addition to that, the, co the coal refuse energy and reclamation tax credit pays these miners an additional $4 a ton for every ton that they burn. So there's the additional subsidy on, on that. And on top of that, these miners also participating in various ways in our power grid get additional subsidies from ratepayers on that as well. Now, uh, Stronghold Digital Mining are one Bitcoin mining company that owns the Scrubgrass and Pampa Creek waste coal plants to mine Bitcoin. When they filed for their initial public offering in the summer of 2001, in their SEC re reports, they claimed, in the prospectus, they claimed that this package of subsidies Pennsylvania was offering meant that 60% of their energy generation costs were going to be funded by taxpayers and ratepayers in the state. Um, so we are all very much paying these, uh, these operators and these Bitcoin miners to operate. We're also seeing Bitcoin mining happening at fracked gas sites. So Pennsylvania has better than 7,000 fracked gas wells scattered across the state. Um, drilling to the Marcellus Shale, sometimes the Utica Shale. Um, but generators, or excuse me, Bitcoin miners, will go to these sites, they will have, could be a trailer on wheels, a large generator unit that's plugged directly into the wellhead. And the methane gas comes out of the wellhead, generates power in this generator, and that from that generator, they have essentially shipping containers full of Bitcoin mining units, running units. 
uh, January of last year, the Department of Environmental Protection inspectors went to one site and they found, this was a big dog energy site in Clearfield County, they found 10 megawatts of generators plugged in and running on the site. The, the, the operator didn't have permits for this. They, nobody was notified about it. Um, there was no public comment or anything like that. And they effectively showed up one night. Um, we have another uh, issue just recently with a company, Diversified Ener Energy in Pennsylvania. Where, now, Diversified has applied for a permit. It has, the EP hasn't taken action on that yet. But even after they were applying for the permit, a media report just weeks ago said you know, there's indications that they were actually operating and that they were beginning they were beginning operations before they before they had obtained a permit. So the nature of these facilities, they're very hard to tell how many of Pennsylvania's 7,000 wells might have them. Other than physically going to the well and looking, you really can't tell. And the fact they're on wheels and relatively easy to move, they're very hard to track. Being that they're hard to track, it's very difficult to, uh, to be confident that they're accurately reporting their emissions. The one picture here is from an, um, a Department of the Interior report, and this was, this was out west where they found Bitcoin miners were siphoning gas off wells without paying lease fees. So because they're hard to track, they aren't necessarily reporting as they should. So this raises questions. Do we know the emissions coming from these wells? Do we have an accurate track of that? Pennsylvania doesn't have a severance tax for oil and gas, but we have an impact fee. And this raises a question of whether they're actually paying the impact fee as appropriately. Without transparency and without tracking, it's very hard to know that. I don't know that anybody can say with confidence whether or not they are. The other factor that the frack gas miners are causing is noise pollution. We've seen that particularly um, uh, particularly for the uh, for these uh, shipping container based units, where they'll come in and have hundreds or thousands of these mining units all running cooling fans that can get very very loud. Uh, typical data centers tend to be in very thick secure buildings meeting noise uh, uh, noise criteria. Uh, often there's other people in the office buildings that are that. Uh, sort of drive this effort to uh, meet noise pollution criteria, but we don't really get that as much when on these shipping container units. Uh, there was a situation in Western North Carolina where the residents said it was like a jet engine that never stopped, and they could hear the whine from this miles away. Now that's annoying, of course, but there's also uh, uh, evidence showing that noise pollution has public health and environmental impacts. It certainly impacts human health, it impacts livestock and agriculture, and it likely impacts wildlife as well. We don't really have, without even being able to track where these, where these mines are, it's very difficult to say whether or not we're meeting our responsibilities for protecting uh, agriculture, wildlife, and human health in these areas. So in addition to frack gas, Pennsylvania is also seeing Bitcoin mining happening at new plants. So the Terra Wolf project at the Susquehanna nuclear plant um, is talking about putting 80,000 Bitcoin miners in. There's an additional talk about putting Bitcoin miners um, at the Beaver Valley new plant. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we're really not seeing hydro, solar, and wind, or even power, or even just use of the power grid. Those happen in other states. Um, yeah, but we are seeing, you know, this coal, nuke, and uh, gas-based mining. Now, nuke, you, people do look at that and say, well, at least they're not using a fossil fuel, so at least that isn't polluting. But that's really not true, because what happens is we take uh, carbon-free energy, in the case of nuke power, that was going to our power grid, and once we divert that into Bitcoin mining, the, the power grid gets its energy from someplace, that's going to be backfilled, and that will largely be backfilled by uh, methane gas-fired power plants at this point. So even the source, even when Bitcoin is mined using, even when it's used in the clean and renewable sources of energy, if as long as you're diverting power to the grid from the grid, it's still not clean. Um, now, the one thing that the crypto mining industry has been fairly innovative about 
is coming up for justifications for this use of energy. And I thought I'd touch on a bunch of them here. Um, starting, off, starting off with the greenwashing claims, one of the uh, typical ones we hear is proof of work uh, could use what they call wasted clean energy. Now, uh, as somebody that works in the energy field, I don't think there is wasted clean energy. We do not have the clean energy we need to decarbonize our power grid yet. Um, but there are situations, in particular, we don't really see this in Pennsylvania, we've seen this in California and some other places though, where on a particularly sunny, windy day, you may have more generation from wind and solar than you need. Prices can actually go negative. Doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen on occasion. So the Bitcoin miner argument is, well, well, when prices do that, when prices dip and prices go low, we can ramp up our operations and we can use all of this energy that you would otherwise waste. And they, yeah, they could do that, but that really isn't the solution we need. Again, there isn't wasted clean energy. There's energy when we need the energy, we just don't have it where and when we need it. So rather than essentially give the energy to Bitcoin miners and have them waste it on Bitcoin, a better solution is to, be, is to invest in storage and transportation infrastructure so the, we can get the energy to the places where we need it. Eventually, end goal being to decarbonize the power grid, we are going to need to address that problem and we might as well work towards that. We might as well work towards that solution. The other similar argument that we'll hear from Bitcoin miners is that their enormous appetite for energy incentivizes new renewable generation. Again, not what we're seeing on the ground, certainly not in Pennsylvania. And there's a couple of reasons for it. Uh, one is that, as we said, particularly with renewable generation, it doesn't meet, meet the cycle that Bitcoin miners like. They want to run 24 seven. They don't want to shut down at night when the sun's down. They don't want to be dependent on the wind. They want to run all out as much as they can to maximize their hash rate. It also doesn't meet the business development cycle. When you're talking about a new power plant and solar, wind, or even a gas plant, it can take years and years and years to develop a new plant. I mean, in some cases it'll take you know, upwards of seven, eight years people, or longer people have been working on plants. And the investment can easily, well, it's always millions for a substantial plant and for larger plants, particularly these fossil fuel plants that can easily be into the billions. An investor who's going to put up that kind of money for a facility is going to want to know that there is a market for that power. And saying that, well, Bitcoin is here and it has this incredible energy demand today isn't really that comforting for these investors to put up billions of dollars. Because we've seen, you know, this is likely a speculative bubble that could crash at any time. If they put up the money and the demand isn't there seven or eight years down the road, when the plant gets built, well, they've lost out. I mean, if they wanted to invest in Bitcoin, they can invest in Bitcoin today. They, you know, they can just put their money directly into it. They don't have to risk it on a power plant and, and hope they'll recover it years down the road. So it really doesn't act as an incentive. And even if it did, it's missing the point. As we try to decarbonize the power grid, Building new clean renewable generation to fill a need that we are going to you know, waste burning Bitcoin doesn't advance the ball. We need to build new clean renewable generation that is used to power the grid that is going to offset either existing fossil fuel production or when our carbon free nuke plants retire, something that's going to take their place. Building it to use it doesn't really get us anywhere. It, well, it, and it actually arguably takes resources that could go into doing the sort of decarbonation, decarbonization we need. So not a really good strategy that way. The Bitcoin miners also focus a lot on uh, power grid claims. We'll see a lot of claims that, um, well, a Bitcoin miner can curtail when demand is high. So yes, they use an enormous amount of en energy, each one, but when power prices get high, when grid prices get high, when the grid is under stress, the Bitcoin miners can shut down. 
And like many things, there is some truth to that. Yes, they can. Uh, we saw this in Pennsylvania with Winter Storm Elliot, where 30% uh, or more than 30% of our uh, uh, gas fired power plants uh, were forced outages. They failed to run when they were called. They weren't appropriately winterized. They couldn't run. It caused an immense strain on our power grid. Peak, uh, typical prices on our power grid on a day like today, probably around uh, $30 a megawatt hour. Is, is probably pretty typical wholesale price for a day like today. When you get up to um, a situation like we saw in Winter Storm Elliott on Christmas Eve, the peak zonal prices were over $4,000 a megawatt hour. To be sure, any Bitcoin miner that was buying power from the grid had stopped buying it at that point. Um, like one of the latest reports I've seen from one of these miners said their break-even point was, it could be between $50 and $80 a megawatt hour. So once it gets back to that point, they shut down. So yeah, shutting down is good for the power grid, but the there's the cost. All the other time, when power was $20 or $30 or $40 a megawatt hour, these Bitcoin miners are pulling power. Essentially, they're either pulling it directly from the grid or they're diverting power that would be going to the grid. And what that's doing, that increase in demand increases wholesale prices. So what they do is they increase wholesale prices all the time for everybody. Then they're saying, but when it gets really, really bad, then we'll stop. But at that point, we often actually pay them to stop as well. Um, because of grid rules, they act, they, they, act, um, they act as demand response, and they are actually getting paid not to run, in addition to the fact, well, they wouldn't have been profitable if they ran anyway, so they're not going to. Again, on the grid, and we're seeing this mostly out of Texas, claims that Bitcoin miners will again incentivize new power, new capacity to come in on the grid. This is one of the things that has been floated as the solution to Texas's perennial grid problems. Again, not likely to happen for much of the same reasons that we're seeing in solar and other things. The, the financial incentives just don't line up on the right time scale that somebody is gonna float billions of dollars on the hope that Bitcoin is going to keep this plant in operation. Um, yes, and that's not, not really likely to happen. A Bitcoin preserving capacity, this is another claim they have. We see this up in New York, around Seneca Lake in New York, there was a coal fire power plant that had retired and a plan came in place to bring it back to life mining Bitcoin. Again, did it preserve capacity? Well, yeah, that sort of thing could preserve capacity, but this isn't the kind of capacity we're trying to preserve. Uh, we're trying to preserve maybe the carbon-free capacity, and we're trying to transition the grid, but if we're going to address the climate crisis, we can't be artificially extending the life of coal-fired power plants, and particularly for something like Bitcoin that isn't particularly vital in the first place. Um, Aside from that, there's a whole bunch of other ar arguments that you'll hear anytime you talk about Bitcoin and the environment. When I, uh, and after testifying before the, the Senate a couple months back, um, for some variation of all of these. Um, well, the, probably the most popular one these days seems to be this comparison with electric vehicles, saying Bitcoin uses electricity, so it's bad. Electric vehicles use electricity, so they must be bad too. Again, this is a false equivalence. Electric, electrification of the transportation fleet does a couple things. One, using an electric vehicle replaces often a fossil fuel vehicle and pollutes less in the process, even if it uses grid power today. Plus, once you have the vehicle in the fleet, as you electrify the grid, as you clean your power grid, this gets cleaner as well automatically. So you're doing, you have a really two benefits. Not only are you reducing pollution now, you're also creating a pathway to further reduce pollution later. And transportation is depending on where you are, the number one or two sector contributing to the climate crisis. So it's something that we have to address in, elect in electrification. It seems like the best plan available today to do that. Another fallacy that we will see a lot is claims that the mining hardware is very efficient. And 
the truth there is that if you want to do 100 trillion of these cash calculations in a second, there is nothing more efficient than one of these ASICs for doing that. But that isn't measuring efficiency at the right place. Uh, it's almost comparable we see in uh, electric heaters. And I think maybe people have seen on late night television ads for these little portable electric heater units. They're electric resistance heaters, basically a light bulb in a box. And sometimes they say that they're 100% efficient. And they are. All of the energy that they use ends up as heat in the house. Problem is, there's a whole lot better choices to heat your house than electric resistance heat. Heat pumps, you know, ground source or air source heat pumps are going to work a whole lot better um, and put more heat in the house for less money. So saying your mining hardware is efficient, not really, you know, not really answering the question when it's something you don't have to do. Also, Kalinda, if you want to move. You know, if you want to move 200 tons of dirt, there's nothing more efficient than using one of these gigantic mining trucks for moving 200 tons of dirt. Uh, but if you can build your road without moving the dirt, you can't say using this mining truck is, is efficient. And that's exactly the situation we have with Bitcoin. We can do blockchain, we can do cryptocurrency without this wasteful proof of work. So making claims that your mining hardware does this really, really well really doesn't uh, really doesn't compare. We also say, well, the mining hardware doesn't emit. And this is a this becomes a really interesting issue in how we talk about emissions and how we think about regulation going forward. So what people when people say mining hardware is zero emission and, and, and it doesn't emit, they're looking at a box. There's the mining hardware, they're putting that in the box and they're saying no pollution is coming out of that box. Of course, it's plugged in somewhere. And that's causing pollution, but they're saying their box isn't emitting. So that stuff down there isn't their problem. They're not thinking about that. Their box is clean. We've seen this really at a national scale. When the Obama administration uh, issued the Clean Power Plan under Section 111B of the Clean Air Act to address carbon pollution from the electric generation sector, one of the provisions is that these plants had to adopt what's uh, known as the best system of emission reductions. Now, the Obama administration's EPA looked at that word system and said, hey, this is a broad term. We can't put the plant in a box, look at the fence line and say, we are only going to look at things coming from the fence line. We're going to look at the system. We're going to look beyond the box. Um, that was challenged in court. Trump administration came in. They um, effectively repealed the Clean Power Plan and uh, instituted their own plan, the Affordable Clean Energy Plan, which went back to this idea of looking, looking at the facility in a box. And we really can't do that. If we're going to be decarbonizing our grid, if we're going to be decarbonizing our economy, we have to look beyond just these little boxes. Um, so, yeah, there's also all manner of just basic libertarian uh, talking points. Uh, one of the uh, one of the questions one of the senators asked when they testified on this, they said, well, is it the government's job to tell people what they can and can't do? Which the answer is yes. And we do that all the time. We do that for, we have energy efficiency standards for appliances. We have cafe standards for vehicles. When we build new power plants, we tell them they have to use the best system of emission reduction or reasonably available control technology or some other uh, technology standard. We tell people that when you have equivalent choices, if you have two trucks and one runs on leaded gas and run, run, one runs on unleaded gas, they both accomplish the same thing, but the government tells us you have to use the one with unleaded gas. You can't buy leaded gas for your trucks anymore. Yes, yep, people might not like it, <laughs> but yes, that is in fact the government's job. They do have a right to tell people what they can do and they do that all the time. And the, I think the final argument we hear is, and there's a bunch of them are uh, some version of this, where it's, yes, it wastes energy, yes, it has problems, but it's all gonna be worth it because of some reason. And this is the idea that, well, Yes, it's going to damage the environment, but if we make enough money, then it's somehow justified. 
And I actually had this conversation with somebody not too long ago, and that's what they were trying to get at. They're saying, how much money do we have to make? How much do we have to say this is growing the economy or doing good things to say that this is all going to be worth it in the end? And they certainly did not want to start thinking about the social cost of carbon, the impacts of climate change, more global issues. They were just saying, hey, you know, if I make, you know, a million dollars at this, is that good? Can I do this anyway? Even though um, it's going to have effects on other people. Um, and that's going to be a question that we're going to have to, uh, you know, address for this and a lot of other things going forward. So getting down to our final slides, so I'm going to do a brief uh, uh, rundown of some of the policy solutions we can think about, and then we'll open it up for some questions here. So reporting and transparency, Senator Markey has the Crypto Asset Transparency Act out there that would require these facilities to report. This would be really valuable, particularly in Pennsylvania, where we see these mining happen at, uh, at wellheads that we really don't have a good handle on. Um, when a Bitcoin miner comes to town, often they'll tell people it's a data center. They won't even say necessarily it's Bitcoin mining. So having transparency into this is essential for anything we do going forward, hoping to, uh, hoping to regulate or at least get a handle on it. Removing the subsidies for crypto mining. Again, you, know, you get what you pay for. And right now we are paying for polluting sources, uh, particularly in Pennsylvania to a large degree. We can seriously look at removing those subsidies. We haven't seen any bans in moratoriums in Pennsylvania. New York has a moratorium um, that, um, where as they're working on the problem, China banned crypto entirely. Of course, they still make the hardware. They're still one of the biggest manufacturer of those ASICs, but they don't have, they're not using their energy on the mining operations. So we have seen those bans in other, in other countries. Um, there's certainly a policy tool to be considered. Uh, energy efficiency standards is one that we can think about. You know, we have energy efficiency standards for appliances. We could use that same model to create energy efficiency standards for crypto boxes. Of course, we'd have to do that in a way that addresses, that really measures energy efficiency in the right place. So it measures it based on the ultimate utility of what you're doing, not just the fact that, well, yeah, it does, it generates, uh, it does a lot of hashes very, very fast for a relatively small amount of money. Then we can look at things analogous to this best system of emission reductions. We can, rather than look at regulating emission sources in their own little boxes and ignoring what their impact is on the grid or ignoring what their impact is in downwind or other things, that we look beyond that box and say, how can we make our energy system as a whole sustainable and how can we decarbonize things moving along? So I will stop there and open it up for questions. Maybe I can see. It's a question on average, yeah. A lot of people in the room. Questions from the room. How people are typing. So, so I, I, okay, so while we're waiting, then I have a question. Who uses this stuff? In other words, it's like, you generate electricity, you know, a lot of people are using electricity, but who uses the Bitcoins? How, how big, what, what is all this, who is all this happening on behalf of? Most of the Bitcoin transactions seem to be coming from a relatively small number of users. Um, it's not, it's not a thing where people aren't buying their morning coffee with crypto on a regular basis. Um, there's, I mean, there certainly are a wide number of people that hold it as investors. So people, you know, people are buying it and holding it in wallets and accounts, spec, speculating, hoping it'll go up. It doesn't really get used a lot in transactions. Somewhat for international transactions, it can. Uh, we see that moving money. There has been in the past a lot of illicit transactions, um, things like the Silk Road, which was a an online drug site. Dark web drug deals happen using Bitcoin and child pornography and stuff like that. Transactions happening uh, using Bitcoin. A lot of that has has stopped using Bitcoin, although it uses other forms of crypto, uh, because Bitcoin is people have found that it's it's traceable. It's not as anonymous as they thought it was. Um, 
it's anonymous to move it around, but at the input at the inputs and the endpoints of the system where it connects to dollars, uh, people get caught. Why don't you go to the chat? It looks like you've got two. Okay, so are other uh, cryptocurrencies mined, Ethereum, et cetera? Um, there, there are probably thousands of other cryptocurrencies, and yes, a lot of them are. Ethereum, that uses a system called proof of stake. So essentially what happens, and there's lots of variations on what proof of stake means precisely, but for, crypt, for Bitcoin to be the one that mines a Bitcoin, creates a block, you have to be the one that guesses this number correctly, that makes this calculation. You use a lot of energy. And by putting that energy into the system, you have some incentive not to mess things up. Because if you do, then all of that energy will be wasted. So that's kind of the use of this use of the energy keeps you honest. In proof of stake, it's somewhat similar, but rather than using energy, they essentially have to have a certain amount of the coin, in this case, Ether for Ethereum, and they have to stake that. They have to put that up. And if they mess up, <laughs> if, they don't add, if they don't validate the next block correctly, they could lose that stake or it could devalue that stake. They have to prove that they have an interest in the system and keeping the system honest. And that's what keeps the system, that's what keeps proof of stake going. There's other ideas out there. I mentioned proof of work and proof of stake. There's quite a few papers where people suggest different variations. But you know, so yes, you could say mining happens with other with other uh, with other cryptocurrencies, but it's not proof of work mining like you see. There's another question further up. If you, yeah, there you go. Uh, that's a CLE. Okay. Question. So what's your preferred solution? Um, immediately, we really need transparency. We need to know where the sources are, the sources need to report, because there's no effective way that we're going to do any other regulation without getting a handle on it. Um, I think that those of us that look at this in the environmental side probably need to be talking to those people working on consumer protection and banking issues, as we've seen. And I didn't touch on them at all here. <laughs> Um, but we've seen with these crypto exchanges like FTX, and there's been uh, pro problems over the years. You know, I think we need to have a, dec a decision of whether this is something that we really need to be doing at all. Um, but if we are doing it, we've got to be keeping our eye on the ball of what is a sustainable pathway uh, to decarbonize our grid. And this is not helping us. <laughs> this is this is taking us in the wrong direction. Your question came about in the chat. Um, so are other states doing things that are appealing to you uh the moratorium in new york certainly um where they've essentially put a pause on this while while they work to while they work to figure this out that's certainly something to look at we're seeing some bipartisan interest in places um particularly around in rural communities around the noise issues um, I think there's a whole whole other issue out there about how we, particularly in Pennsylvania, regulate noise. It's been mostly a local nuisance issue that that we've let it down, let local communities handle that, and not really had a coordinated state approach to that. So we would have, you know, we could look to what some other states are doing in that regard. Uh, I certainly wouldn't suggest following the Texas model for their power grid, but they are. Actually, talking about there's there's bills in place where they talk about things like not subsidizing cryptocurrency specifically. So there's people in Texas that are realizing the risk here. Um, whether or not that actually gets through, it's something that we really want to keep an eye on. What does this all do for consumer costs? I mean, it's difficult to track. Um, you know, certainly when you have people taking large amounts of power from the grid, that's going to that's going to create upward price, upward pressure on wholesale grid prices. Um, you're going to see that pressure on electric prices. Um, some of the, um, I think, the more notable issues we're seeing with Bitcoin, with you know, was Bitcoin or was cryptocurrency in general related to some of these bank failures and some of the things that we've been seeing. 
I mean, I think there's questions there, and there's certainly consumer costs that are being passed on from there. Uh, that isn't directly related to the energy consumption from Bitcoin, but that's some that's something to be concerned about. Somebody said, uh, uh, if the U.S. were to ban or regulate mining, would it be driven to Mexico or Canada? Well, yes, it would move, um, and that's one of the one of the things that common arguments that we see for really polluting resources in general. We say, well, we want to have the polluting gas operations here because if we don't have them here, they're going to go someplace else that doesn't have the same environmental standards. That is an ethical problem that we're going to face with any environmental thing we do. Um, if the U.S. took the leadership and put a moratorium on proof of work on a moratorium on crypto, Yes, you would see miners move. They moved here because China banned it. Um, they, you know, that really what, what, caused the, what caused the spike here. But one of the things that's going to do is create added pressure in the market to use alternatives like Ethereum that aren't wasteful. And you know, we, by taking that step, that would go a long way to incentivize other countries to say, hey, they took that step, China took that step. Okay, everybody is looking, everybody who looks at this says, yeah, this is a bad idea. We didn't want this sort of waste here. Um, that's likely to uh, transfer to other countries as well. Good question. So under the Federal Energy Efficiency Law, you can set standards for particular appliances and industrial equipment. Could the federal government use Federal energy efficiency law to say, look, if you're going to make this cryptocurrency, you can only use so much energy, similar to what you might do with a fan or an air conditioner. It, it would, if if the Biden administration essentially would do that without legislation, it would it would guarantee a lawsuit. This is going to be a novel. This is going to be a novel approach because it isn't the sort of thing that we do. We look at the efficiency of you know, the oven or the microwave and things like that, we haven't really extended that to something like crypto. And um, particularly with the Supreme Court and their current attraction to major question uh, doctrine, it's it will be challenged under that. So we can't say, you know, would this survive a challenge? There would be a challenge if it was, if it happened. We can't say whether or not it would survive a challenge without, without specific legislation. You know, it would certainly be an interesting thing to see. Uh, but that goes for a whole lot of other things as well. Certainly energy efficiency standards are one. There are things in the Clean Air Act. I mean, there is Section 111D, where if the administrator of the Clean Air Act says that this industry uh, it makes an endangerment finding, saying this industry endangers uh, human health and welfare, then they can set standards that includes this best system of emission reductions. You know, could that sort of thing be done? Would that be applied? It would, um, yes, it seems to fit. Now, whether or not that would survive a court challenge, that's going to be one of those interesting um, decisions going forward. So we've got like a minute or two left. Are there, there, are there key points you want your listeners to take away or are there key things you'd like them to do in terms of talking to their public officials, talking to their friends. I think one of the real dangers we have now is the thought, and we've heard this among a lot of elected officials, is cryptocurrency is new technology. We don't want to regulate new technology. We want to see where it goes. This stuff might be really, really good. Uh, so one of the things that I've personally been trying to do is talk to people about this, saying, this is dangerous. <laughs> uh, we you know, Bad things can happen. You know, whether or not you ultimately agree, uh, elected officials, policymakers should pause, step back and say, this just is, this isn't as simple as this is a new business coming into my community. Let's support them. I mean, certainly it doesn't create a lot of jobs. I mean, crypto miners only have like, you know, maybe a dozen jobs for a large one. Uh, but stepping back and thinking before we go into certainly subsidizing it anymore, supporting it would be, I think, a major first step. Well, Rob, thank you so much. This has been a terrific presentation. Thank, thank you. you all uh, who are, are on Zoom. Um, you've got the evaluation form to fill out. And um, the evaluation and link is up in the chat. And, uh, and it has been published, <laughs> put in the chat several times. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And thank you, Rob, for thank a wonderful you. presentation.